Hi, I'm Niall O'Leary here at the Noble Maritime Collection. I would like to welcome you to Untold Stories of the Titanic, Part 2, Last Port of Call, part of the Noble on Watch series. Now to tell you more, here's Sonia Joyce, Director of the Titanic Experience across the ocean in Cove. First of all, can I say thank you very much to Dawn Daniels, Programme Director at the Noble Maritime Collection, for inviting me here today to talk to you a little bit about the unique history that we have in Cove, in Cork, in Ireland, which relates to the story of Titanic. First of all, I'm going to tell you about our town. Our town, Cove, is just 30 minutes from Cork city centre. That's Ireland's second largest city, and we're located on the southern coast here in Ireland. We are a harbour town, so the town is built in a hillscape overlooking the harbour here at Cork. Our harbour is the second largest natural harbour in the world, only beaten by Sydney in Australia. So that leads me to just share with you the depth of maritime history that we have is just as broad as it is deep. I suppose today I'm specifically focusing on the history and the relationship of the town to the story of Titanic. To put it in perspective for you, Titanic was a ship that was owned by the White Star Line, and the White Star Line was one of sh several shipping companies that had offices here in Cove. Now, Cove at the time, back in 1912, was not known as Cove, just to add a little bit more depth to the story. It was known as Queenstown. Queen Victoria arrived here in 1849, and the authorities decided to rename the town in her honour. Now, back in the 1920s, when Ireland regained its independence from the UK, it was deemed appropriate to rename the town back to Cove. So there can be quite a bit of confusion when we look at this particular period in history as to whether we're referring to our location as Cove or Queenstown. So we generally accept both as okay. So Cove was a very busy and important transatlantic location. Um, it was a very, very busy port. We had many liners uh, stopping here weekly on their schedules between the years of 1848 and 1950. They were moving not just passengers, but also mail. It was a very strategic mail point here. Um, in addition to the White Star Line, we had Cunard uh, lines, but we reckon two and a half million passengers in total would have emigrated from the town of Cove in that period of time that I referenced. In fact, about one and a half million of those left from the building where I am sitting today, because I am sitting in the building that was the office for the White Star Line. In April 1912, one of the liners that was scheduled to stop here was the Titanic. It was scheduled to stop here on April 11th, 1912. As many of us know, Titanic was built in Belfast. It passed its sea trials in early April of 1912 and was brought to Southampton to begin its maiden voyage. White Star Line had commandeered their most senior captain, Captain Edward Smith, to take the lead on this voyage. They were looking for his status to promote their new, bigger, better, more luxurious liner and to appeal to very, very wealthy uh, clientele. Now, it wasn't the wealthy clientele really that they picked up here in Cove, it was more the emigration class. And the emigration class were also privileged to enjoy much improved standards on their transatlantic journey upon these new Olympic class liners. So Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage from Southampton on April 10th. She sailed as far as Cherbourg, where she picked up additional passengers and then arrived into Cork Harbour on the morning of April 11th, 1912. On that morning, here within this building in the White Star Line, 123 passengers were awaiting to board. Titanic anchored at Roaches Point at the mouth of the harbour. For speed of turnaround, all transatlantic liners anchored outside the port or at the mouth of the port. Passengers and mail were tendered to and from the ships on small tender boats that left from the buildings here in Cove Town. 
So on the morning of April 11th, 1912, we had 123 passengers in total awaiting to board the ship. We had seven second-class passengers. We had three first-class passengers. But the majority of our passengers, 113 in total, were third-class passengers. This would be very common at the time. It was mainly poorer emigrants looking to seek out new lives in North America that would have left on board these passenger liners coming to and from the Port of Cork at the time. There were also passengers who disembarked here in Cove. We had seven passengers who had taken passage from Southampton to Cork. Included in those passengers were Father Brown, a Jesuit priest, well known to us here locally. His uncle was the Bishop of Cloyne, and as a gift on his ordination, had gifted Father Brown passage on board Titanic in first class from Southampton home to Cork. While on board, Father Brown, a keen photographer, took many, many pictures. He befriended many of the first class passengers, and in fact, one wealthy American couple offered to pay his passage on to New York so he could continue to enjoy his time on board Titanic. He messaged his uncle, the bishop, to seek permission to continue on his journey to New York. He got a one-line telegraph in response. The response simply read, get off that ship. According to his uncle, enough fun had been had. It was time for him to come and take up his post as a Jesuit priest here in the locality. And that decision and that telegraph probably saved his life. For has he, had he continued on board Titanic to New York, he probably would have been lost to the tragedy. It is hard to imagine a man in his position taking a seat on the lifeboat. As a consequence of his you know, disembarkment here in Cove, not only was his life saved, but so were the catalog of images that he had taken. So rare to have these images, and they're used throughout the experience here at Titanic Experience in Cove to help us tell the story of Titanic through the passenger's eyes. So in addition to Father Brown, there was a family, the O'Dell May family. They were a family of five. They were also traveling from Southampton to Cork to holiday here in Cork. They were also first class passengers. So there was Lily O'Dell, her sister-in-law Kate, her son Jack, and her two brothers, Robert and Stanley May. So they had arrived here to hire a car and mix business and pleasure here for a couple of days. They disembarked, they hired a car at Johnson and Parrott, which is still a well-known brand of car supplier here in Cork. And they enjoyed a holiday here, absolutely oblivious to what was going on and what was happening to their fellow passengers a few days later. In fact, Lily O'Dell was so consumed by her trip on board Titanic that she kept some possessions that she had with her dear to her for the rest of her life. We were fortunate to come across some of these items in later years and we have acquired the suitcase which she had purchased especially from Harrods for her trip on board Titanic. She kept that suitcase in good condition throughout her life and it was passed on to her family after her death. She also wore a beautiful coat on board that had faux tortoise shell buttons. We also managed to acquire one of the buttons from that coat. And we have those here on display at Titanic Experience in Cove. She also had a fan that she had purchased especially for the trip, also on display here. In addition, we have acquired a fabulous family photograph taken by one of the Odells. It was actually Kate Odell took the picture of all the other four on deck on board Titanic. It's just a wonderful glimpse of life as it was before the tragedy struck. So the family heard of the tragedy during their time here in Ireland and they returned back to the UK. They were so distraught by what had befallen their fellow passengers, they went on to attend the memorial mass held in one of the cathedrals in London. Obviously, being so close to a tragedy must have affected them their entire lives. 
So in addition to Father Brown and the O'Dell family, there was a lady traveling to Ireland to meet with her husband. That passenger was uh, Mrs. E. Nichols. We don't know a lot about that particular passenger. And they account for the seven passengers who disembarked. Now, in addition to those who disembarked, we do have a wonderful story about one of our stokers. So one of the stokers who had taken a contract with White Star Line to become a stoker on board from Southampton to New York and returning back to Southampton, he had a return contract. His name was John Coffey. Now, he was from Cove. And while in port here, he hid in the mailbox, or he hid amongst the mail, and he was taken off uh, and abandoned his post here in Cove Town. His desertion did not become known until after the sinking of the ship. Of course, they were looking to account for everybody, and that's when it came to light that he had actually come aboard here in Cove. When the press sought him out to kind of ask him about his story and to question him a little bit more, he said he felt the ship was doomed. He felt he had a bad feeling and he needed to get off the ship. So that's why he hid among the mailbags. Story doesn't add up that way because he had a history of doing things like this. It really does seem to us that he had just hitched a free ride home because by the Sunday morning, he had already taken another job on Mauritania and he was off on his adventures once again. So that is our lucky stoker, John Coffey, and we absolutely love his story. The pier at the back of the building today is the original pier that was used all those years for all those footprints and all those footsteps. We reckon over one and a half million passengers would have used that as their last steps on Irish soil. It's very poignant, it's very it's a stark reminder of the sadness that accompanied the immigration here in Ireland. For many passengers, their fares were sponsored by uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters who had gone before them. And many of them would not be able to afford to return to visit family back, left back here in Ireland. So the pier is known locally as Heartbreak Pier for that reason. Our first class passengers were the Minahan family, and that was a family of three and they were second generation Irish American who had returned on holidays. Our second class passengers were mixed up of those returning on holidays and those emigrating for the first time but the majority the 113 were made up of first-time emigrants. Their fare is sponsored by cousins, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts who had gone before them. Of the 113 passengers uh, many travelled in communities and many travelled in families. For example, we had th two brothers and a sister who travelled together. We had 14 who travelled from one parish alone. They're, they're known to us here as the Adrigu 14. They would have celebrated and, and also there would have been much upset within the village to lose such a large number of young people. We also had a lady called Margaret Rice. Now, Margaret had lived in America with her husband for many years, but he had tragically been killed in an accident. So Margaret returned to Ireland mourning her husband with five young sons. She went home to her homeland to be embraced and minded there amongst her family as she considered her future. So after a period of around two years here in Ireland, she decided it was time to go back to America. She had originally planned to go back in May, but she changed her plans because there were other people from her location that she knew traveling in April. And she decided it would be easier with five young sons to travel with a little bit of help. So therefore, she changed her travel plans, unfortunately sealing her fate. Margaret and all her five sons did not survive the sinking of Titanic. It's one of the cruelest and saddest examples we have here of the story of Titanic. We also had some love stories that I'd like to share with you. People often know a lot about Titanic purely due to the movie. And of course, the movie is based on fiction in terms of the, the storyline, um, but with much, lots of fact. Uh, built in there. Uh, 
But the love story of the movie inspired me to research the passengers that we had here in Cove to see if there were any love stories of our own. And in fact, I came up with four. So I'm going to share one with you that's very, very relevant to this year, and that's the story of Hannah and Tom O'Brien. Hannah and Tom were newlyweds, and they were traveling to Chicago to start a new life there. Tom, for some reason, had not informed any of his family that he was married to Hannah. So when Tom was lost to the tragedy that it was Titanic, Hannah survived. There was some compensation paid to family members of those who were lost to Titanic and Hannah being the next of kin to Tom made her claim and received compensation from the White Star Line. In the meantime, Tom's family, not knowing of Hannah's existence, went on to make a claim also. It was very interesting in those times to see how they kind of dealt with one another and the hierarchy of families, because it was the elder sister who made the claim. When it came to light that the claim had already been settled to his wife, a letter was written back to the family homestead in Limerick, where the eldest brother resided, and he must be notified of these events. And the letter that was sent back was simply uh, a letter that Tom's eldest sister had received from Hannah, which simply said, I produced my marriage certificate. Thank you very much. I have made the claim. You needn't worry about me or my daughter, because of course Hannah was pregnant and subsequently went on to have a daughter. Um, it caused complete confusion and excitement is probably the wrong word, but you know, within the family circles. And that letter that Hannah sent to her sister-in-law was sitting in a Limerick farmhouse for many, 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 many years. About three years ago, or four years ago even, I, I'm not sure exactly how long ago, a very elderly lady and two elderly men rocked into the experience here and did a tour with us. At the end of the tour, they called over their tour guide and handed her an envelope and said, we'd like you to have this. We opened the envelope to discover this letter from Hannah O'Brien to Tom O'Brien's sister, explaining the circumstances of the settlement with the White Star Line. It was an incredible piece of history that was gifted to us so unconditionally by a wonderful family who were just out to keep the memory and the story of their uncle alive. Unfortunately, Hannah herself went on to suffered tragedy again just a few years later. Hannah, who was raising a young daughter, had met and found another life partner and had married again and had gone on to have a second child. But unfortunately, in 1918, she succumbed to the Spanish flu and passed away. There's another passenger I'd like to mention. His name is Daniel Buckley. The reason I mentioned Daniel is because he was pivotal to the US Senate inquiry. His story really shows us what it was like for those third class passengers desperate to escape on the night of the tragedy. So third class passengers were treated to a lot of luxuries on board Titanic. White Star Line had really pulled out all the stops, not just for first class passengers, but also for second class passengers. Second class on board was more like first class on other ships and third class conditions were more like second class. In fact, for many third class passengers, they had better conditions on board the ship than they did at home. They had access to running toilets, they had access to water, they had access to three very generous solid meals a day. In true Irish spirit, lots of dance and music were involved in the journey on board Titanic and indeed all the passenger liners of its time. In fact, going through our own passenger eyewitness reports, those surviving passengers who gave eyewitness reports, we have identified that there was indeed a party in full flow on the night of the tragedy. It had pretty much wound down by 11 p.m. and passengers were retiring when the actual ship hit the iceberg. But up to that point, there were quite a few drinks being had, Eugene, I've forgotten his last name, sorry. We had a passenger who was actually playing the Ellen pipes on board that night. 
So many passengers were enjoying music and dance on board. So for our 123 passengers, we had just 44 who survived, which means we lost 79 of the passengers who gathered here at the White Star Line building on April 11th, 1912. So here at Titanic Experience Cove, what we hope we do is give you the perspective of the Titanic story from the eyes of the passengers. And we hope to keep the memory of those passengers alive for many years to come. Thank you, Sonia. That was amazing. I feel inspired to do a dance as a tribute to the memory of those who died and to evoke the joyous celebration that always takes place in Ireland to celebrate a life well lived. But first, I'm going to play the spoons. <laughs> 